Okay, everyone, apologies. Um, I think I should be... Okay, hooray. That means the wall clock and the echo all gone. I'm assuming so. Apologies. Hopefully you have some sympathy for homeworking and being turfed out uh, of the room I usually work in uh, for family reasons. Uh, my daughter needs more space than me. Uh, the wall clock was fine. Okay, let's get up and running. Uh, what we're going to do is run through a demonstration uh, of collecting uh, police data uh, for England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, again, Julia will uh, keep an eye on the questions and the chat. Uh, fantastic. Uh, the link as well uh, to the code we're using today, um, if you'd like to follow along, um, Julia should be able to uh, post that uh, into the chat. Um, I think she's doing that uh, right now. I won't waste any more time. Uh, let's uh, get stuck in uh, to collecting uh, data. Uh, so this lesson today is about getting data from APIs. Um, so we're going to take a look at uh, using Python for downloading data uh, from the web. Uh, and we're also just going to try and cultivate your computational thinking uh, skills. Uh, as well um, through some coding examples. Um, so how do you define and solve um, a computational method, a data collection problem uh, using computational uh, methods? Let's make that a bit uh, more legible. Um, so we're not going to assume any previous knowledge of Python um, or collecting data uh, from the web. Um, it would have been useful uh, if you've participated in the first two sessions, but it's not a requirement. Um, I'll talk you through everything uh, we're doing. We're using police data, so it's social science data, but if you're from a different background from the private sector, uh, that's totally fine as well. The techniques you're going to learn um, apply much more broadly. Uh, yeah, and we're going to look at what an API actually is and understand the kind of key steps and requirements for going about collecting data from an API and being able to use Python for this particular um, task. So hopefully you'll get quite a lot out of um, today's session. So this uh, is a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, some of you will be familiar with it now. So it mixes live Python code with some narrative uh, like you're seeing here um, and the results of the code um, as well. So if you're following along uh, with us just now, um, basically you just have to run or execute the cells uh, that are marked by this IN square bracket symbol uh, and it'll be up here um, on the left. Uh, so, for example, this is a um, piece of Python code. Uh, it's a very simple piece. Some of you will have um, probably seen it before. Uh, there may be uh, a little bit of a lag in terms of accessing the notebook, just because if you're all accessing it um, uh, at the same time, um, Yeah, uh, so if it's not running um, right now, so sometimes it, uh, the notebook might need to be uh, reloaded. Um, okay, never mind. Um, thankfully, I have a version on uh, my machine. Uh, it's just because I think we're all accessing it um, at the same time. So let's give a quick demonstration of using Python code. Uh, there we go. It asks for my name. Uh, yeah, and enjoy more about uh, getting some data from the web. So very quickly, uh, what an API is. So it's short for uh, an application programming interface. There's a formal uh, definition, which is probably not terribly um, helpful. How I understand it is it's an intermediary between software you know, applications. So in much the same way that a translator sits between two inv individuals who wish to communicate with each other, um, so what you might have an English speaker and you might have an Italian speaker and they don't speak a single word uh, of each other's um, languages. Therefore, what we need is a translator. The person speaking English doesn't only needs to worry about um, communicating what they want to say in a way that the translator understands. And then they do the hard work of communicating uh, with the other person. Obviously, that simplifies what you can say to the translator. The translator won't be able to understand every single thing you would like to say, but they'll understand enough to allow the two of you to communicate um, with each other. 
So similarly, an API um, simplifies how applications communicate uh, with each other. Uh, so for example, um, we have this quick look here. So a program wants some data, it connects to the API, the database talks back to the API uh, and goes back to the program. So for example, if I had a smartphone application that needed um, real-time traffic data, for example, from Transport Scotland, um, I could go directly to Transport Scotland's database, but then I'd need to know a lot of really technical information about how that database actually works, what language it understands, how the data is returned, all sorts of really technical things. But if we put an API in the middle, that takes care of uh, talking to the database and it takes care of talking to us. So we can send really simplified requests to the API for data. It communicates those requests to the database, takes back the data and then passes it on to you in a format that you can understand um, also. So think of it as an intermediary um, or some kind of uh, translator. So what's the general approach? So it's always good to map out um, what we call maybe the pseudocode or the algorithm or just the general approach um, for getting data through an API. So the first thing we need to know is the location of the API. So that's its web address. So where is the API found? So that's common, you know, um, it's the same, you know, format as, you know, a link to a website. So the UK police API uh, is located at this um, web address. So that's reasonably easy. I just did a Google search for police data API and it brought up um, some data that looks interesting. Then we need to know the uh, terms of use associated uh, with the API. So a lot of APIs will restrict how many you know requests for data you can make in a minute or in a day or over a year, um, etc. They might have different levels of access. So there's a free level and there's an enterprise level and there's a, you know, a custom level where you pay the most money, um, for example. Uh, with the UK Police API, um, you don't need to register. You don't need to provide any password when you make a request for data. Um, it's essentially an open data um, portal, which is good. Um, it does restrict how many requests for data you can make, um, which is 15 per second, but it's unlikely you'll be making so many requests. But you can imagine a more sophisticated app that is, you know, repeatedly and um, constantly making requests for data and that could overload um, the API. So we know where the API is, we know how we can use it. What data is available on the API? So we're interested in where the data is available through the API um, and that's known as something called the endpoint. So the endpoint is the location of the data on the API. Again a technical term but the endpoint as you can see here is again essentially um, a link or a URL or a web address. So if we were to uh, click on that link just now, um, that won't work because we need to formulate the request um, more appropriately. But when we use Python to do this, uh, we'll be able to request the data um, that's found um, at this uh, location. So the location of the data is known um, as its uh, endpoint. So then we have three bits of uh, information. Uh, then there are three uh, essential tasks we need to perform to get the data. So we need to register um, our use of the API. In this instance, we don't, but for most APIs, you probably need to register. So we used the Guardian API recently. Um, I needed to register with my email address uh, and get a um, password that I can use. Then we want to actually request the data itself, the actual interesting um, bit. Uh, and this is known as making a call to the API. So it's just a slightly different terminology. Requesting data, making a call, and um, mean the exact same thing. And of course, we want to save the data because we don't want all of our work to be um, uh, done in vain. Uh, we want to save it um, for future uh, use. So let's take a social science uh, example uh, quickly. So let's get some um, up-to-date crime data for England and Wales and Northern Ireland. For some reason, Scotland and the British Transport Police are excluded uh, from this database. Um, I won't make any comments. So let's find the API. So we've kind of established that um, it can be found uh, here. And as I just showed you previously, there's not actually anything uh, available at this um, web address at the moment. It's simply the you know the, the stem or it's the base 
um, of the web addresses we'll be using to request data. So every request for data uh, will begin with this, and then we'll add on um, uh, options. So for example, if we were interested in all uh, police forces, now we can see that that's a valid uh, web address. Uh, so here we've got the stem uh, as far as here, and there we go. Uh, if we want all forces, uh, here we get a nice list uh, of all the police forces uh, available uh, through this uh, database. So good, so we're off to a good start. Um, as I said, if you can click on it yourself, that would be really good. Uh, before we delve a bit deeper, let's again just establish how we can use uh, the API. The police API is reasonably well documented. <laughs> it's not always the case uh, at all. I think someone posted about the Twitter API and getting into a bit of a mess. Yeah, I agree, it can be quite difficult to navigate. And you know, that's got a lot of documentation, but it's not particularly helpful. So of course, with the police API, no authentication needed, don't need to register, do not need to provide a password every time we want to try and get some data. Uh, so we can make on average 15 calls per second with uh, up to 30 uh, in a single second, um, if that's you know uh, untypical or infrequent. It's highly unlikely you'll exceed um, the rate limit for this purpose if it's research, but you know, you may have an idea for an app using police data, um, so you don't want to uh, be restricted um, either. And finally, uh, we need to know the endpoints. So we need to know the location of the data that's available through the API. Um, it's got over 20, I think it's got 21 different data sets, uh, data resources on the API, um, categorized as information about police forces. So you can get a list of senior officers, um, crime itself, so different crime categories and events. Uh, information about neighborhoods uh, and what we look at today is you know stop and search data which is quite interesting uh, as well uh, and again there's usually uh, well for this uh, particular instance uh, there's really good um, documentation uh, so here you have again a list of all the endpoints um, and instructions about how you would request uh, data uh, from this endpoint but I'll do a lot of the hard work for you uh, today so we can skip this step, don't need to register, we can get straight on to uh, requesting uh, data. So let's get to the interesting bit. So let's focus our activities, let's uh, define a task uh, that's uh, reasonably interesting for us to uh, complete. So my first step is I'm gonna download a list of police forces in the UK. Uh, for each force, uh, I'm gonna download its stop and search uh, data. Uh, and then I'm gonna save everything that I've downloaded to uh, various files so I can use them uh, in the future. So the first thing is to get Python uh, set up with what we um, need. Those of you who've used Python before will understand um, what's happening here. Uh, basically, a lot of functionality and methods that you would like to use for computational research, um, they don't come as standard with Python, or if they do, um, they don't launch uh, when you start up Python. So lots of things you know, are available when you begin Python. Uh, you know, computation, whoops. Uh, so if I wanted to multiply two numbers together, um, I can do that you know, uh, already. Uh, that's not working at the moment because it's a little text. I need to make that code, there we go. So. With Python, you can do things out of the box, so to speak, calculations, print messages, all these kind of things. Um, but if you want to scrape web pages, you need to load in the requests module. Um, if you want to work with a certain type of file known as JSON, you import the JSON uh, module. Nothing difficult about this. Um, you may have experience of using R um, for loading in libraries, for example, um, or in Stata, you might have installed some user written um, packages uh, as well. So we've set up Python with what we need, only a handful of packages, which is really good. Uh, so we're going to tackle task one, which is getting a list of police forces uh, in the UK. So I'll run the code first uh, before talking through. So basically, I need to define the web address uh, that we're going to use to request data. So we know, for example, that there's a base URL and that'll always be there. So it's handy to put that in a variable you know, called base URL. And I could call that what I wanted. Um, that makes sense uh, to me. 
And then I know that data about police forces um, is located at the forces endpoint. So again, I just create a variable um, called forces, which stores that um, value. And then the web address that will actually work um, for requesting data um, is a composite of the base URL plus uh, forces. And you can see here, um, the plus symbol, if you have two bits of text, joins the text together. While if those variables were numbers, they would add the numbers you know, together to produce a result. So this is the uh, URL we're using. Again, just as proof, you can see that it really uh, does work. Uh, that's the URL we need. Then we start using the requests module. So first, from the requests module, we use the get method and we ask Python to get or you know collect the information um, located at this uh, web address. And we store all of that in a variable called response. Uh, and then what we want to do is check whether we made a successful request for data. Uh, thankfully, there's a status code um, attribute associated with the response variable. If it equals 200, fantastic, you've actually successfully requested data. If it's in the 400s, um, it means you haven't formulated the request properly. Maybe it's a typo. Maybe the web address is invalid, for example, but it's uh, quote unquote your fault. If it's a status code in the 500s, um, there's something wrong uh, on the end uh, where the API is. So maybe the website is down, maybe the server's not working, uh, maybe the web address has been moved somewhere else, um, for example. So basically when we request um, any website or you know an endpoint or something from the web, um, a status code of 200 means uh, well done, you've uh, successfully requested. But what have we actually requested? So we're not interested in status codes, we're interested in data. Uh, in the response variable, we've got a method called JSON. So that's a particular data type. JSON is a type of data. And um, we can use that method to grab the data and put it in a variable called forces data. And then when we call that variable, it should list yeah, all the forces uh, in the UK. So you can see it's maybe a slightly unfamiliar data structure. So it's, you know, it's a long list um, of forces. Each force has two variables. It's got an ID variable with the unique ID of that force. Uh, and it's got a name variable, which, you know, as you would expect, is the name of the force uh, in question. So even just a cursory glance shows that, you know, the data hasn't been returned in tabular format that we're used to. You know, every row is an observation, every column uh, is a variable. Uh, so it comes back in a different format. It comes back in something called um, a JSON format. Thankfully, Python gives us lots of um, ways of manipulating that type of data. It's not that difficult. It's just probably um, unfamiliar if you're a social scientist. So voila, very simple task. Uh, we've been able to get a list of all police forces, uh, excluding Scotland and BS, uh, BTP. So hopefully you'll agree that the requesting bit is relatively simple. You define a web address and you use the requests module to go get the content that's stored at that web address. That's pretty easy. Um, it's the data that's returned. Um, it's kind of the difficult bit really of working uh, with an API uh, in my uh, experience. So just to show you the importance of you know how data is stored, um, I'm going to define two variables here, uh, one called my number and one called my string, so a numeric and a you know text variable. Uh, this should work, you know, if I add the number 50 to a number, um, but if I try and add it to a piece of text, um, Python kicks up an error. So you can't you know connect a string and an integer together, um, but you can obviously add two uh, numbers. So how does that impact what we've just done? Well, we've gotten some data back from the API. It's good to check what type of data um, that actually is. So we can use Python. We can say, okay, tell me the type uh, of data this variable is. Um, and you can see that we have what's known as a list uh, data type in Python. And you can also identify lists by the opening and closing uh, square brackets. So if we go back, you can see that the this variable here uh, begins and ends um, with some square brackets. So that tells you you're working with um, a list. So now we have a list. Uh, we can count how many elements there are in the list. So how many police forces were actually um, returned? 
So we can use the length function, the len function. So how long is the list? Uh, there are 44 elements in the list. So there are 44 police forces um, contained in the list uh, that we downloaded. Okay, that's good. So what if we wanted to look at each police force in that list uh, separately? So what we can do is use um, a loop. So we can say for every force in the list variable, um, ooh, I'd like to say that's a deliberate uh, spot. So for every uh, force in this list, um, you know, print the value of that variable. So show me the actual information for each uh, force. Uh, and then I just print a blank line underneath just for some uh, separation. So again, we're just looping over a list. So a list has um, an ordered set of elements and we just go to each element and we look at each uh, uh, element in the list. Uh, again, uh, when I said I had an error, I didn't really, I could, you know, this is just basically a placeholder for every L, uh, which is element in the list, you know, print it. Um, you'll be bored of this if you've watched me do it. Um, I've used this example before. For every chicken in the list, you get the same results because it, it you know, it doesn't matter. I'm just saying this is a placeholder for every element in this list and just show me every uh, element. So that's enough chicken examples. The final thing we can do if we're working with a list is we can pull out a particular element um, by referring to its location uh, in the list. Because as I said, a list is ordered. So there's element one, element two, element three, for example. So if I wanted to know which police force uh, is found in position uh, 10 um, in the list. So we can use some square brackets again, and we can insert a number referring to uh, that position in the list. So Dorset, so Dorset Police is the 10th uh, element in the list. Are you slightly confused that I've used the number nine to refer to position 10? Uh, yeah, it can be a little bit uh, confusing. Python counts, um, it begins counting at zero. Um, this is in contrast to R, for example, which begins counting at one, um, and humans who also begin counting uh, at one. So the value nine refers to position 10 in any list, um, not just the list we're using. So a very simple rule of thumb, because you may get caught out with this in future, is element number n is located in position n minus one um, in the uh, list. So that's just a bit of a rapid uh, tour of the list data type uh, in Python. Um, and now that we've just gotten up to speed, uh, now what we want is the unique ID of every force uh, that's contained in the list. And it would be good to store those IDs themselves uh, in a list that we can use um, later. So this uh, neat little bit of code um, for every force in the uh, list that we've downloaded, um, extract the value from the ID field. So there's nothing really uh, difficult here. Uh, and then we store all of that in a variable called force um, IDs. And then by calling on the variable, it produces uh, the results. So I'll just do it again to show. Um, now you can see we don't have the name variable anymore because all we've asked for is the ID variable for every force uh, in the list. And because we've done that, then we can loop over the uh, list of IDs and we can request each one of those forces um, using the requests.get method. And uh, we'll see that um, in a moment. Uh, if I'm doing that, apologies, I think maybe um, hay fever is coming is coming home. <laughs> so we've uh, constructed our list of um, force IDs and I've just talked us through that. Um, so we've got something we can use. So while we will uh, loop over all of those IDs and get stop and search data for you know every um, police force, that's contained in the notebook. Uh, right now, I'm just going to simplify the task. So I'm going to say, get me stop and search data for the City of London Police Force. So we're just going to keep it nice uh, and uh, simple. So again, we've got much the same uh, process. We've got the base URL, which we always need. Uh, now we're not looking for force data. We're looking for search, uh, search for stop and search data. So the endpoint is different. So it's uh, stops uh, hyphen uh, force. And then I want to search for a particular force, uh, which is the city of London. So that's the unique ID um, from the force ID list that we just created. So again, I construct the web address. Uh, it's slightly longer because it's the base URL plus the endpoint. 
um, plus a custom search term. That's what this question mark force equals uh, is doing here. Uh, again, we'll print the web address. We'll request the web address. We'll check if we were successful. We'll store the data in a variable called um, SAS underscore data. Um, and then for every um, element in that list, I'm just going to add a new field uh, called force and it takes the value uh, of this uh, here. Uh, you'll see why I'm doing that in a second. Um, basically, it's because if you request stop and search data, obviously you know which force you've requested because you've specified it here, but actually in the returned data itself, it doesn't actually tell you which police force uh, the stop and search data um, refers to. Good, so I've just executed the code. Uh, this is the web address uh, containing the data of interest. It kind of flashed up there. You can see that there's a lot of data um, for that police force. So there's 170 different uh, records for stop and search. Um, and here you can get a look at what the fields are in this data set. So there's an age range. Uh, so they stopped somebody between 18 and 24. Um, the outcome was you know, nothing, nothing needed to happen. Self-defined ethnicity, their gender. Um, uh, they were interested in an article for use in theft, uh, for example. So some really interesting data to do with stop uh, and searches. But again, we don't need to, you know, look at the data that way. We've downloaded it into Python. That means we can continue using Python um, to check uh, the data. So this is just you know, looking at the exact same information in Python this time. Again, this is the person we were just looking at. They're between 18 and 24, uh, etc. Uh, and you can see, you know, as it scrolls down, whoops, uh, there's lots and lots uh, of stop and search uh, records, which is pretty uh, interesting. Um, so we'll just close the results. So how many um, stop and searches were there for the city of London? Uh, remember that we're working with um, a list, so we can use the length uh, method again to say, well, how long is the list? So there are 171 uh, stop and search um, instances uh, that we've downloaded um, from the API. So we've got some stop and search data. We've got a list of police forces. Um, it would be interesting to store those for future um, use. So because the data comes in something called a JSON file format, it's good to export it uh, in that format also. In maybe future uh, demonstrations, or you can contact me if you're interested, um, you can convert JSON to CSV. Sometimes that's easy, sometimes it's not that easy. Um, but if you want to work with something uh, in a different format, that is possible um, also. So the first thing we're going to do is create a downloads folder and just to store the results. Um, so I've run the code there, it's created the folder. If I tried to run it again, you can see that, hey, this already exists. Uh, no need to create the folder um, again. I'm gonna do some simple things. I'm gonna collect today's date. It's useful to get today's date, I think, for naming your files. Um, so we're gonna create a file that'll store the list of police forces. Uh, I'm gonna call it uk-police forces, today's date, and it's a JSON file. And then we've got the city of London, again, um, it goes in the downloads folder. I'll call it this with today's date and it's a JSON uh, file. Uh, so an in turn, I open each file and I dump the JSON data uh, into each uh, one. So in this instance, all I've asked uh, the code to do is just print today's date. Um, we need to actually check that I have saved the uh, data. So the simplest way is to check whether A, the files were created, uh, and B, the data were actually um, written uh, to it. So we can use Python to check the downloads folder. So basically, show me all the contents of the downloads folder. That's what's happening here. Um, okay, it's definitely created some files, the ones I wanted. That doesn't mean there's actually anything in the files, uh, so we need to check that um, also. So basically, all I'm doing is importing the data back in. So let's open the police forces uh, file. Uh, we're opening it in read mode. So we're not trying to write data to it. We're trying to read data from it. Um, so we're gonna read the contents of the file, store it in a variable called data, uh, and again, just call that variable and take a look at what it contains. Uh, and again, voila, um, the file does actually contain the uh, list of police forces uh, that we're interested in. 
So I just, again, wanted to uh, control myself and stick to one example. Um, so that's a quick tour of the UK Police um, API uh, in Appendix A. So I'll show you uh, in just a moment. Um, I've got a little bit more code, maybe uh, that much, if that makes sense, um, of how you could search, uh, stop. you can collect stop and search data for every um, police force. Uh, but for now, before I take some questions, uh, I just want to, uh, you know, just briefly reinforce what we've actually done. So it's been, you know, uh, it's been quite quick, but, you know, um, we've learned how to import modules uh, into Python. So you know that for certain techniques, um, you need to uh, bring the uh, functionality into Python. And that's really simple. It's the import uh, command. And uh, we've learned how to make requests or calls for data uh, to an API. Uh, and that's worked really well, thankfully. Um, we've learned how to handle and save data that's uh, returned uh, by the API also. You get data back in something called a JSON format. Um, that's different from a tabular format. It requires slightly different data manipulation techniques than you're used to. Um, but we've learned uh, a few ways of pulling out you know, the ID field um, from a JSON file. Um, and we've learned how to save uh, that data uh, as well. Uh, and hopefully I've done all this in a fairly efficient, clear and you know, effective um, manner. So again, very quick few. Uh, thanks for you know, putting up with the uh, technical homeworking um, issues. I think interacting with an API is fairly simple, easy for me to say, I think maybe at this stage, but I don't think it's drastically difficult. Handling the data that comes back for analytical purposes is challenging, uh, certainly, but making the request for data, I think you can get up and running. And I'm sure you've got lots of good ideas yourselves about what you would like to do um, if you could get that data. If you're collecting data from an API, you've got to think about you know, um, data protection, um, so, for example, if you're collecting, you know, personal information from Twitter, you know, do you have to seek consent for getting that information? That's one um, issue. Um, you have to obviously comply with the terms of use. So you have to stay within the, you know, the number of calls you can make per second, per minute, per day, uh, whatever that is. Uh, and I call them many other murky <laughs> ethical um, issues. But hopefully, I think you'll hopefully agree that it's quite an exciting uh, area um, of social science or computational research um, in general. So hopefully, good luck with um, progressing your own research on that. Um, I'm going to take uh, questions. I haven't been looking at the chat because now I'm on my uh, phone because I don't have my second <laughs> monitor. Um, OK, yeah, so I'll start taking some uh, questions now. Uh, fantastic. Um, yeah, so Julia will be uh, sharing the link, which is fantastic, uh, to the GitHub. Um, so all this, um, I'll just come out of slideshow mode. All of this, you know, is um, available on our GitHub. Um, and there, you know, again, we suggest some further reading and resources, uh, all free, uh, again, uh, and some uh, extra code. Um, for scraping uh, stop and search data for lots of different um, police forces. So we've got a question here about um, when I extract the data from the list, it still includes HTML uh, tags. Um, yeah, so you, I, I take it you're probably scraping a web page rather than using an API, correct? Um, you can uh, reply back to the, the chat if you want. I'll keep an eye. Uh, so if you're scraping um, data from a website, you're not just scraping the content that you see on the website. You're scraping the underlying code behind it, which is known as uh, HTML. Uh, so then it's not enough to just have the um, requests module. What you need also is the beautiful soup module for navigating um, a HTML uh, data type. So in the way that we've used the JSON module um, for dealing with JSON data, you would need the beautiful soup module for working with the HTML tags um, that are returned uh, when you scrape um, a web page. Uh, that's not the case when we work with an API because we're downloading the actual data itself. We're not scraping it. Um, it's been designed to actually share data um, that should be usable um, pretty uh, quickly. So yeah. Uh, Long answer short is basically if you see um, last week's um, demonstration, which is also on YouTube, and all the code is on the GitHub, 
um, then you'll see how we can actually extract the HTML tags um, from uh, data that you scrape uh, from the web, um, if that's okay uh, for an answer. Um, and yeah, sorry, Julia has been uh, responding um, as well. Uh, can you show the answer for the task um, just at the end of section four? Oh, good. So somebody's been working through the notebook uh, at the end of section uh, four. Yep, yeah, certainly. Uh, so in this example here, I've imported the uh, data in the forces um, file. Um, if I wanted the city of London, uh, remember that previously I called it col. Um, so if I call on uh, the col underscore out file uh, variable um, and I read in the data that's stored there, uh, there you go. Uh, there's the city of London um, stop and search and uh, data. So yeah, just to go back here, uh, there's a variable called col underscore out file and that points to the location of the file containing stop and search data uh, for the um, city of uh, London. Fantastic, thank you for the question. Uh, oh, okay, so the use of the Gov API. Okay, uh, I'm taking that's the UK government uh, API. Um, probably easier uh, to contact me after this, just because it might take me a while to, you know, on my machine, try and find similar data. So if I can address your one, uh, offline, uh, then that would be fantastic. But I'm happy to help you figure out what's going on with that. Um, yeah, I've got a question about the uh, Twitter um, API. Uh, yes, very good question. It seems slightly different than the police API. Yes, Twitter is, you know, is obviously understandably protective of the data it holds. So it does ask you to register your use of the API. Um, it's quite unfriendly language because it, um, it asks you to register your application or your app. Twitter is assuming that you're trying to build a smartphone application that uses Twitter data, um, and hence, you know, that's that's what you're you know you're trying to do. You know, as researchers, maybe you do want to build an app at the end, but you probably just want to get you know a hold of the data uh, itself. Um, but uh, someone uh, you know contacted me about this recently. It, it looks really onerous, but actually you just have to fill out, you know, some questions about um, the name of your app. So that could just be your research project. Um, it'll ask you questions about whether you're sharing data with government officials. I mean, which again is almost never the case. Uh, and that doesn't apply to, you know, you sharing your findings, you know, with colleagues or with, you know, in a briefing paper. And um, that would be if you use the Twitter API to get data and then immediately you transfer that data, you know, to a government department. You know that wouldn't really uh, be allowed. Um, so yeah, so for Twitter and Facebook, it can be uh, a little bit more time to register your use of the API. Um, but once you do, um, I mean, they're quite open to academic research, um, so it should be okay. Uh, you should be able to get access um, to the data you need. Thank you. Uh, let's see if there's a couple more uh, questions. A uh, question I missed about Google. Oh, yes, I did. Thank you. Uh, okay, do you have any experience with Google Trends? Hmm. Uh, no, personally, I do not. Um, Google does have uh, a lot of APIs uh, allowing you access to some of its uh, data. Um, I'm presuming Trends has an API. Uh, Yeah, you probably can get Google Trends data from uh, an API. Um, yeah, that's something I'd need to look into, but I presume um, you can. Yeah, I mean, there's mention of one here. So there's a Google Trends uh, API. Yeah, so okay, so it should be doable in theory. Um, there's a second part to your question, which is quite uh, interesting, um, which is a more general point is, you know, when when we were using the you know police forces API, um, can you just change you know the you know web address slightly you know to get different um, information? So I mean, yes, you can. Um, I know that Dorset is you know um, a valid uh, force uh, ID, so I can search for that. 
Um, and yeah, you'll find you'll find that you can change the web address slightly. It's almost like a little trick, um, you know, to access uh, you know information. Um, I won't show you other examples because I think by doing that, sometimes you can actually get access to files that you're not really meant to scrape or to collect. Um, excuse me, but yes, in theory, you can uh, you know you can change around the URL for an a for an API excuse me, or for a web address, and that may actually, you know, get you access to the data um, that you uh, need. Uh, yeah, so fantastic. Uh, I can only scroll back so far uh, on my phone, if that's okay. Um, yeah, so if we can, I think we shared uh, the GitHub link. Um, if not, don't worry, um, because you've all signed up uh, through Eventbrite. Um, we'll be emailing you uh, after next week's final session um, about um, setting up your computational um, environment. Um, yeah, and we'll have a full set of links to all the uh, code demonstrations. Um, I can just show you uh, quickly where you can get that. Um, who am I signed in as? Perfect. Yeah, so we've got a, a dedicated repository for all the coding demonstrations um, and there's a code folder uh, and at the moment you can see we've got intro to Python, web scraping uh, and the API's uh, code as well. Um, and hopefully it worked for you. Yeah, if you're to click on the you know uh, binder link, that just saves you downloading Python and Jupyter Notebooks um, to your uh, machine. So uh, given that we had a late start, I am reasonably early. Um, Thank you. Thank you for putting up with the uh, substantial technical um, issues. Uh, Julie and I will be in contact soon. Um, uh, hopefully you've learned um, a little bit about how to uh, interact with uh, an API. Um, as I say, the notebook has a little bit more reading, uh, a few more tasks um, it asks you to do. Um, I'll just run the code in the appendices uh, really quickly, just to prove that we can get um, stop and search data uh, for every police force uh, in the same block uh, of code. Um, it takes a wee while um, because actually there's a lot of stop and search data, um, as you can imagine. Um, yeah, it's quite a lot actually, so 44 forces, you know, times hundreds and hundreds of results uh, per force. Um, yeah, it's deciding to be a little bit slow, so uh, <laughs> we leave it for now. But yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, please contact me, you know, via my Twitter or my email address. Uh, very happy to help out. Um, I hope you're all doing well, and I hope I'll see uh, quite a few of you uh, next week uh, as well. So thank you, and uh, speak to you soon.